Good morning. Our Bible reading this morning is from John 10, verses 7 to 10. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The chief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it in the full. This is the word of God. Morning. Oh, now I've got to put this, what's that? There's water down there and I've got to turn this on again. Is that right? Well, it's good to be back. Uh, it's been some years since we were here in, in this church and um, yeah, it's lovely. Um, we, for those of you who don't know us, um, myself, Karina, the family, we've lived in, in um, a part of the PNG Highlands for the last uh, 23 years. Well, we do go and come from Narracourt where we have a home and I work in the clinic when I'm, I'm back and it turns out that I'm on call today uh, <laughs> by some, some accident. So uh, Nicholas has got the phone. It's only for anaesthetics and there's no women in labour needing epidural, so I think we're okay. <laughs> I did check before coming. Um, yes, yeah, so um, that's where we've been and, um, and at this stage of our life now we've decided to come back to Narracourt more permanently, um, mostly to be closer to my ageing parents. My mother's coming to, to live with us uh, shortly actually, next weekend she makes the move so that's a new chapter in her life and ours as well. Um, and, um, but I will still be going and coming from Papua New Guinea. In fact, I'm going back next week uh, because I still work for the university there part-time, so I will be doing shorter, shorter trips there. Um, we have four kids. Uh, the elder three uh, are not with us. They're spread all over doing various study and different things, but our son Nicholas is still here with us, and uh, he'll be attending the local high school here from, uh, from next year. So... We just celebrated on Friday his last day of his homeschooling journey because he was kind of halfway through his year 10 pathway and uh, so Karina has been doing this uh, education for 20 years now and and Friday was the last day so uh, we went down to Mount Gambia for a celebratory dinner so that was a change uh, in in life for both them and Karina. Um, I uh, wanted to share with you um, from this particular passage in John 10 which I really love this particular story. It's this communication that God has with us is really quite, quite genius in many ways. I'm getting at this stage of life where I need glasses and it's, uh, it's not sitting well with me. As you can tell, I'm fumbling around. And, um, but um, I just reflected on this particular language that he uses in this story in John 10:7. Because it really is just a picture of the lowliness and love of God. Just the way he uses this particular analogy. Because it's just so simple. It's just so simple. You think about it. I mean, he, this is the God of heaven who knows how to make DNA and understands the internal workings of a star. He could speak to us in a language that's so high that it, it would be just incomprehensible to us and yet here he says to us I'm the door of the sheep it's just so so lovely I the image that comes to my mind is of sitting you know an infant child on your knee you know you don't talk to them about engineering do you or Plato or as interesting as those things might be you sing incy wincy spider climbed up the water spout down came the rain and washed poor Incy out. That's what you do, isn't it? Why do you do that? You know, as you're, not, you're not ashamed to do it. You're not ashamed to look an idiot. You're doing it out of just the joy of trying to create a bond with a, a forming mind. 
you know, there's, isn't there just something beautiful about the fact that connection that you can get with a young child just looking into them and you sing that song and draw on their hand and the fact that, I, you know, I'm actually communicating with this child who can't understand 99% of the things that I can understand but they can understand Incy Wincy Spider and that's enough for me to have that relationship. That's what's going on here. This is the God of heaven who's whose language and whose thinking is so far above our own. In Isaiah it says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. He says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, that's how much higher my thinking is to your thinking. And yet here he comes and speaks to us in this language that any person of that era or this era could understand what it is he is trying to say. It's just so lovely. In verse 9, he goes on to expand that statement. In verse 7, he says, I'm the door of the sheep. And in verse 9, he expands on it and he says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and go out and find pasture. We can't know everything there is to know about God. We can't even know a fraction of it. That's, that's what we call knowing exhaustively. No one can know exhaustively about God, but we can know certain things truly. And this is one of them that he gives us in this passage. The genius of the Lord's communication is that it's so simple and yet it's just so profound. Even in this verse, I think you'll find that there are just pearls in this that, are, that just grab me and have held me for years. And the first is in this statement, I am the door. I am the door. So simple. Well, what's in that, you might say? I am the door. Well, the first thing, and perhaps, you know, the golden thing in this whole message for me is just the simple statement that there's a door. That there is a door. You just ponder on that fact. There is actually a door. I want you to imagine by some form of witchcraft that you have been cast into the heart of a mountain and you find yourself waking up in a cavernous system buried deep in a mountain. Imagine what that would be like, struggling around in total blackness, total silence, fumbling for a way out. Imagine the terror and the hopelessness that would overcome you. And now imagine in that scenario what a ray of light would do to your soul. The hope and the excitement that there's actually, there's a way out of this mess, out of this hopelessness. Just the primal, you know, sense that would come to you in that moment. That's what this is saying, that there is, there's a way, there is actually a way. And being human beings, being what we are, we focus on the darkness, we focus on the negative things. It's very easy um, to think that society is bad and getting worse and there's some justification for feeling that way. And it's very easy for melancholy and depression and hopelessness to overcome us as people. And yet Jesus is saying here, there's a door. There is a door. There is actually a way. The message of the gospel is real hope. There's light, not just darkness. And there's a way instead of confusion and there's real life to be had in this world. I'm going to say something that may perhaps be a little confusing to you, but I hope that it will come through in the end. I want to challenge you that Christianity is not an optimistic religion. Not at all, in fact. But it is a religion that's full of hope. Full of hope. Now you may say, well, that's an odd thing to say. What's the difference? Well, I want to suggest to you that there's all the difference in the world between those two things. I saw an interview on the BBC uh, some years ago now. It's lodged in my brain. Uh, For those of you who are interested in history, there's a famous historian in the US. Her name is Doris Kearns Goodwins. Um, She writes a lot of books, particularly about the US presidents. 
uh, I have an interest in that. And so um, she was being interviewed by um, a particular presenter, uh, for those of you who know Amanpour, on BBC. And to, it was around the time of the last US election. Uh, they were talking about politics. You can imagine perhaps how the conversation went. Toward the end of it, um, the reporter said, so are you optimistic about the future? It was a pretty depressing interview, I have to say, so it was kind of a rhetorical question. But here's the point. What she said in her response, she thought about it for a second, and then she said, we have to be. There's no other choice. We have to be. There's no other choice. Now, that's optimism. That's what optimism is. That's about, I have to stay positive. It doesn't matter what, what the evidence is. I've got to be positive because if I'm not positive, the whole world comes crashing in. It's like a balloon that has to stay inflated. And people who rely on optimism are notoriously um, sensitive to things that are negative. It's very hard for them to handle things that are negative because that's like putting a pin in my balloon. And as the air comes rushing out, all of my world starts to look as though it's going to cave in. That's the nature of optimism. In a sense, it's a bit like a... It's something of flight from reality to a certain degree. It can't, it can't deal well with darkness. But that's not the same as hope. The Bible is not an optimistic book, but it's a book that's full of hope because it deals with the reality of who we are. This has been very important to me in my uh, journey in PNG, I have to say. Because if I was an optimistic person by nature, I would have, I would have tumbled uh, in PNG because the assault of the difficulties and the darkness, there's real human darkness. If you see someone that's been hacked up um, I mean, I can't say too much in front of children uh, here, but the sorts of things that we saw on a regular basis uh, were horrific, horrendous, and ongoing. And people continue to ask me, so is it getting better? It's the optimistic question. I hope that it's getting better. It's kind of, and I have to say, well, no, I don't think it is. Um, now, that's darkness. But uh, if, if I relied on my optimism, I'm afraid I just couldn't keep going like that. Eventually you run out of steam on the power of positive thinking alone. But there's something more to hope. Because hope is something that's bounded in something solid. Let me try and give you a medical analogy. I want to do this sensitively because I know there are people who have been through a scenario like this. But let's imagine that uh, perhaps you're feeling slightly unwell. Perhaps you've just had a routine blood test and the doctor says to you, it turns out that it looks like you have an aggressive form of leukaemia. Something, a blood cancer of some kind. Now there are two ways of dealing with that scenario and I've seen both. Um, one is to say, no, it's good. It's all good. Um, let's stay positive about this. And there are many people who deal with the diagnosis of cancer in that way. Uh, and for them it's incredibly important to remain positive because they feel that the positivity alone is enough to cure this problem. Another scenario would be where the doctor says, well actually this is an aggressive disease, but there is a way forward here. It's going to be painful, it's going to be difficult, it's going to involve me giving medicines which will seem like poisons to you um, they may bring you within an inch of your life and at that moment we're going to transplant your bone marrow. You'll have a huge dose of radiation um, but at the end of that um, there is a cure. Now that's not a pleasant scenario. Uh, you may know people, you may have been through that sort of scenario yourself but it is real hope for a person who has aggressive leukaemia. Um, and that's the difference, is that the hope of the Bible is something that's not about wishful thinking. It's not about thinking positively. It's actually bounded in something real and in something solid. And of course, medical analogies are so poor because medicine is so poor and so imperfect, as you all know, and it's run by people who are so imperfect. Um, and so the heavenly analogies sit imperfectly on that story, and yet you get some sense of what 
I'm trying to say here. If it weren't for the fact that God is real and that his Holy Spirit is real, then eventually the tides of the darkness of this world would overcome all attempts to be positive. But there is real hope because God is real. My um, mother-in-law gave me this book some years ago. Uh, I have two copies, so I've got one to give away. I'm a little bit... My books are like my children, so I give them away hoping that I'll know where they are and when they'll come back. But this one is just so good, it's got to be shared. It's, um, it's about the Welsh revivals of 1860, thereabouts. There's been numerous Welsh revivals, as you may know. This one's great, because it's written by a pastor who's there at the time. So it's not really a historical book, it's just a collection of letters from all sorts of pastors all over the different parishes, telling them about what's going on in Wales at that time. It's extraordinary. It's absolutely extraordinary. And uh, if you ever need encouragement that God is able to move, able to change situations that look so black and make them just come alive with hope, then this book will do your soul a a world of good. Um, I did bring a visual illustration of this point. It's sitting underneath me. Uh, For those of you who have an interest in art, you may want to come out and have a look at this painting uh, later on. It came, I, I saw this Um, picture in an album cover actually for those of you who know the band Sons of Korah they're a Geelong band they sing the Psalms and inside one of their albums was this picture and um, it so caught my mind because it so encapsulates this idea of what hope actually looks like um, that I had to find the artist he's a a Melbourne based artist and um, I rang him up said I'd really love to get that painting and I ended up buying it and it hangs in our home and you can come and take a look later on that Romans 15, 13 says this so, so well. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Why do we abound in hope? Because there's a door. There really is a door. There is a way forward in a dark world and that Um, fills our lives with hope, even in the midst of the challenges and the difficulties of which we've experienced many in PNG. Well, the second part is that there's only one door. He says, I am the door. Now, this is noxious to a modern ear. This is incredibly um, bigoted, for want of a a better term. You know, here he says, I'm the door, I'm it. Um... If it weren't true, it would be a horrendous statement. And yet, here he declares it to us. He says, I am the door. As we know in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Peter says to the crowd, he says, um, there's salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. We have to deal, we have to reckon with this man, the Christ. Um, and that's, it's his world. He's the creator and it's his rules. And that's the way it is. It's not always an easy uh, discussion to have with people. Um, But God has said that there is life. And this life is in His Son. It's in His Son to be had. This one door. The third point is that Jesus the man is the door. You notice He says, I am the door. I am the door. What's the point of that? Well, the point is that we're dealing with a person. I just love this point. You're dealing with a person. You're not dealing with 12 rules for life, as good as those rules may be. Okay? You're not dealing with a philosophy. You're not dealing with a set of principles that are helpful. You're not dealing with a force that pervades nature and all of life. You're dealing, with a hum- you're dealing with a person, not a human being, but you're dealing with a person. By a person, I mean a personality. Now, that's just so critical. It's not a force that spoke to Abraham. A force can't speak. It's a person who spoke to Abraham and said, leave your father and mother and go out. It wasn't a set of principles that appealed to Moses. 
It was a person that spoke to him out of the burning bush and encouraged him to lead God's people. Why does that matter? It matters all the world that our God is a person. When Bartimaeus, excuse me, that's how much I like my glasses, um, when that blind man on the road in Jericho who had been sitting there for years and years in hopeless, uh, a hopeless state, when he heard the crowds approaching, his heart leapt for joy. Why? Not because there was an ethos or a philosophy being held out to him. There was a person. And that person stopped and said, bring him to me. And what did he say to him? He said, what do you, sorry, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Our God can communicate with us. He wants to know you. And he wants you to know him. And he wants to be in relationship with you. I can't cry out to a force that pervades nature. I can't cry out to 12 rules for life. And I can't appeal to Plato to help me in my grief or in my suffering. But I can cry out to God because he's a person. And he can hear me and he can respond to me. And he can hold my hand and he can lead me. I am the door, he says. It's a person that knows you and loves you. And there's all the world of comfort for that. Well, I am the door. The next thing out of this message is simply the answer to the question, if there is a door, then who can access the door? Well, the answer is there in the verse for us. It says, if anyone enters by me... This is the beauty of the biblical message. Anyone can access that door. Any colour, any language, any background, any IQ, any degree of ability or disability, any person, no matter what their background or what they've done, can enter that door. There are PhDs and prostitutes who can enter that door. There are elites and there are criminals, all of which are able to access that door. It's open. There are a lot of people in this town. We're having dinner with a Nigerian family this afternoon. They've come over to our place a couple of times in recent. We have a lot of fun with them. He works out at Tees as a fitter. And, um, yeah, it's just been a real joy getting to know them. And, and um, as I work at the clinic, as you can imagine, we see a lot of people from Tees. There are a lot of Pacificas, people from Taiwan, uh, and all over the place. And uh, I was saying this in, in church just the other day, really, that you know God's house should be just as diverse as the community is diverse. You know, we, we should hope uh, and long for the day when there are Afghan, Afghani people and Nigerians and Pacificas and all manner in these pews. Um, we should learn their songs. We should uh, learn something about their culture. We should, um, you know, because that's, that's the nature of the door. It's open to all people. God's heart longs for all people. Now, I have to say, as someone who's grown up in church all my life, um, that it's, it's not always evident that um, we feel the same way that God was, does uh, about this issue. Um, God's fold is not an exclusive fold. He doesn't have private written on the door or keep out. He is longing for people to come in. And not everyone feels comfortable with that. In my particular church when I was young, there, we had a, something of a small revival and there were all sorts of unusual people coming into church. Alcoholics coming in with their flagons. Um, there were people who had been addicted to drugs who would just walk down the front in their tank tops and they sang very loud. Um, and it was very awkward for people who were not used to those sorts of people. It was a joy 
It was a great joy, but um, not everyone felt comfortable with that. But Jesus always drew much closer to those people, those sorts of people, than he did to the people who felt that they were perhaps better than some. And so that's a challenge to our hearts, that we should long to see God's house filled with all manner of souls, all manner of people, of all ethnicities in this place. Um, it's a real uh, challenge to us. Oh, I've been really struck by just the change in Narracourt in the, in the 10, 15 years that we've been going and coming from here, how, how um, much broader and how many different nationalities are now here. And um, wouldn't it be a joy to see this house and all of God's houses um, filled with people like that? Well, the last thing, so it's anyone can access the door. It's not a door that's labelled private, but here's the kicker is that it's a door for sheep. It's a door for sheep. And this is the difficult, humbling thing. Um, it, it would have been so nice, wouldn't it, you know, if he'd sort of said, it's a door for horses or something dignified, you know, or birds, you know, even a bird cage I probably would have felt better about. Um, but sheep is just, You know, why of all the creatures? Our son Nicholas has been working for a local farmer um, and uh, he came home the other day and they've been doing some crutching or something or other. It's his, his first exposure to this sort of thing. And he was, oh, man, these are dumb animals. They really, <laughs> you know, they, um, they get anxious and they do, you know, I mean, I'm not telling you anything that most, many people in this, um, this church would know far better than me. Why would he choose that analogy? Sheep are so prone to following one another. We don't do that, of course. <laughs> they are so prone to fretting, getting anxious. Boy, hasn't the last three or four years told us something about the human ability to fear and how quickly we are prone to anxiety. They're so prone to acting in ways that seem detrimental to their own good. And of course they can't survive at all without carers. There's no wild sheep. They need people to care for them. Why would God choose that particular analogy? Well, as humbling as it is, the answer is self-evident. Yes, the door is open, but it's open only to sheep. And if you can't accept yourself as a sheep, as one of his sheep and under his leadership and his authority, then that door is of no use to you. And this is where the gospel message really is so different to the spirit of the age. Because the spirit of the age, everything we get told, every movie, nearly every song, is that you have to look inside yourself to find the power within. The triumph of the human spirit is what we're told over and over again. Within you is the hope of salvation. But the gospel doesn't say that. The gospel says, no, you've sinned and you're separate from your God. You're like a branch of the grapevine that's been disconnected and it's withered and curling up and it can produce nothing. You need a saviour. You need to be connected to the master and the creator of your soul. And without that, you'll be like a sheep wandering around on its own in the wild, as vulnerable as that is. You'll be a sheep without a shepherd. What did Jesus say when he fed the 5,000? As tired as he was, he says he looked on them and he had compassion because he saw they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he knew what that meant. It's in seeing that we're actually sheep and acknowledging it that the hope of the door becomes real to us. But that is a humbling thing. Well, last of all, in this tiny verse, 
there is the answer of the privilege for those who use the door. What does it say? If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. They will be saved. And they will go in and go out and find pasture. Well, the first thing in that, the privilege of the people who use the door is that they will be saved. They will be saved. Yes, the scripture does not pull punches on the diagnosis for our souls. It doesn't tell us that we're God's. It tells us that we're creatures made in the image of God, but sinful creatures. Creatures in need of judgment because we've rejected God. And creatures who do not function without their saviour. The diagnosis is not good, but for those who accept the diagnosis, the hope of a cure and of something real, of a real hope, and of really being saved is uh, the joy that animates our existence. You can be saved. You can have a real hope in the place of hopelessness. You can know life that's really full and really free. Not just a pat on the back, not just a G up, not just some emoticons to give you half a second of a glimmer of a feeling, but something that can dynamise and can, um, can energise your soul and give it real hope and meaning. And they can go in. Now, what does that mean? Well, we saw that. It was so lovely. Thank you, Wendy, for putting that effort into the uh, children's talk. Uh, those pictures are very helpful. You can go in. Why would a sheep go in? Well, you go in for rest. You go in for protection. Uh, if you're a human being, you go in for both of those things, but maybe for fellowship and instruction and all of the things that every human being does need in order to thrive. We need those things. You think about the person who doesn't have that. <clears throat> Yes, the sheep who goes in is coming under the authority of the shepherd. That shepherd now has full authority over that sheep. But the sheep enjoys the care of the shepherd and the protection of the shepherd. The sheep who's outside the fold, which is outside the fold, has all the anxiety of having to look after all of that for themselves. Yes, in coming to Christ... We become his disciples, he becomes our master and all that that means. And yet, he's responsible for my soul. He's responsible for the protection of my soul and the provision of my soul. Without that, all of the anxiety of your protection, your provision, what's going to come around tomorrow's corner, that rests on you. It's not surprising that anxiety is the quintessential illness of the age. We're surrounded by anxieties. And yet, within the fold and under his care comes the peace that comes from living under our master. So that's going in. And then it says they go out. Go out for what? Well, go out to serve people. We're very inward by nature. The in part sounds good to us, but in is not enough. We can't live in. We have to also go out. We have to be active in the world. A ship that stays in the harbour is a nice thing to look at, but completely useless. Um, ships are made for being on the ocean, aren't they? And that's rough at times, and yet that's their very purpose. And so, yes, God calls us to come in, but he also sends us out to be on the ocean of life and to be doing battle for people, to be bringing hope to people that don't have any hope, to be bringing comfort to people that are in pain and to be shedding his light um, all around the world. And lastly, it says, they will find pasture. What does that mean? Well, it means that they will find satisfaction. Satisfaction. I remember listening to a song when I was a young Christian by a guy who'd recently got converted and this song was called I'm So Satisfied. It's just a wonderful song. He's just bursting with the fact that he'd been through so many things in his life, so much, and now he could really say, I'm, I'm actually satisfied. 
I'm satisfied. This is, if you read Paul's letters, this is the thing that strikes me. He's an astonishing person. He really is. Apart from Jesus himself, the Apostle Paul is the person in all the scriptures who just takes my breath away. He really is someone who just went through an enormous amount. The guy was stoned. He was stoned. Not stoned in the metaphorical sense, but, but actually he got rocks thrown at him. You know? He was beaten multiple times. He was shipwrecked twice. He was whipped multiple times. And on top of all of that, he had the indignity of various churches saying, you're not a fit leader. We don't want you anymore. We're trading you in for people that can talk better, look better. You know, you just, you don't fit the part. All of those things. And yet... What does he say in Philippians? He said, I've learned in every circumstance how to be content. And he's writing in jail. He's actually in the stocks as he's writing it. You know, how does anyone do that? How does anyone say from jail and in chains, I've learned in every circumstance how to be content? That's a miracle. That really is a miracle. And yet, that's the miracle of the Holy Spirit. I've learned to be satisfied. What does King David say? In the 23rd Psalm, the Lord's my shepherd. I shan't want. What does, what does that mean? It means I've learned to be content. He's going to provide my every need. Not my every, not my every desire. What he's mean is that he's satisfied my soul and that I'm full with the things that I really need. I am the door. Whoever comes to me, whoever enters by that door, will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. It is a dark world. We can say that. We've experienced it. We don't have to deny it. Christian never has to deny the darkness that's real. But we have real hope. Not hope in the power of thinking positively, but hope that's based in a person, a living person, a person that hears our prayers, hears our, our cries, understands who we are and is able to interact and to do things in the world. He can hear and he can respond. He can fulfil your need. He can give you contentment and he can change not only you but those around you. And provide light in the darkness. It's a door for sheep, not for stallions, not for eagles. It's a door for sheep. And so for us to access that hope, we have to come to the realisation that all of our qualities, all of our goodness, all of our intelligence, compared to the glory and the grandeur of God, are not even worth discussing. We are creatures. He is the holy creator and he's the master. We're not gods. We're not dust. We're not animals. Okay, This is the other thing that the scripture makes plain. You're not just atoms. You are not just biochemistry. You're not just chance. The Bible says that you are made in the image of God. And that makes you different to the animals. I, I love and hate David Attenborough, I have to say, <laughs> at the same, in equal measure. Love the pictures, hate the commentary. Detest the commentary, I've got to say. Why? Because it continually makes animals to sound like people. And they're not people. They're animals. And you're not an animal. You're a human being that's made in the image of God. You're more, much more than that. Yet, having said that, this is the tension of the scripture. You're not just biochemistry. You're not just chance. You are more. And yet you're not God either. Which is also what the world would say to you. Isn't that strange? How on the one hand the world can say you're a chance, accident, freak. You know, you're just a clever animal. And yet somehow you're God too. Well, neither of those things are true. You're not just an animal, but you're not God either. What we are is fallen human beings who need a saviour. And having acknowledged that, 
and been willing to be, be a sheep, then there is a real hope and a real pasture to be found and a real satisfaction. And that should make us full of joy even in, in the midst of the darkness. I don't know if you know that sort of hope in your life. Um, I, I confess, I don't know it every day, but I've known it enough in the last few years um, to have been able to rejoice in the midst of some really dark times, some dark experiences. And, and you know, people still ring us from Papua New Guinea and say, oh, guess what? You know, you know that house you just built for the nurse out in that place? Yeah, they just broke in and stole all the, all the stuff out of it again, fifth time. You know, yeah, okay, that happens. Um, but... I can really honestly say that it's the knowledge that God is present in his world. He hasn't given up on his world. This is not the only dark time that's ever been in human history. You're not the only people who have ever felt low from moment to moment. And yet, as these things show, God is there and he's able to inject himself into our experience and into our world and to give us real there is a door. Let me pray for you and as we finish. Father, you know um, uh, our difficulties and inabilities to communicate these truths well. Uh, sometimes it feels like a series of tongue ties and yet the truth is so real. It's so profound just to know that there is a way. There really is light that you have given us uh, and that you have given to the world. You have sent your son into the world. You sent him as light into darkness. It says that the people have seen a great light. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we pray that you would continue to illuminate our thinking that when we read the news or we hear of dark things that we would be able to absorb them but also to see what is behind all of that. To see who you are and what you're doing in history, what you have done, what you will continue to do and that our lives would be buoyed by the real knowledge that you live and that you're powerful and that you're a person who cares about us as people made in your image. I pray for anyone here this morning who uh, does not know you. Perhaps the idea of being a sheep is too difficult for them too humbling. Lord, you bring them to that point that they can come to you and, and ask you um, to become their master and to forgive the sin and the need that they have. Maybe there are people here who feel um, that their lives are so dark and so wrong that you as a holy God could never care for them. Father God, I pray that you would come near to them and assure them of your care that you have for every person that you have made and that you would receive them and give them a new hope and a new joy. And we pray for this church and all the churches in Narra Court. Um, but we pray for a coming together. We pray for a renewal such as those things that we have read. We pray that people of all different ethnic backgrounds would be coming into this church and that we would have the joy of singing new songs and hearing new languages and fellowshipping with people across a broad range of people. Lord, do that for our town. Uh, bring us together and bless us in this way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. While uh, the others are coming up, I realise that I totally forgot to mention the John drama, um, which I will say just two seconds about. Uh, the John drama, for those of you who know about Wycliffe Bible translators, I'm sure that term is familiar to you. Not only do they help in the translation of the, the Bible into many languages, they also uh, do a series of dramas uh, based on the Gospels. There's a Mark drama, there's a Luke drama, and there's also a drama based on the Gospel of John. And there's a project going on at the moment between the various churches within Narracourt, um, to which we would certainly love uh, people in the Uniting Church to consider being involved where we're coming together to do this John drama uh, the week before Easter, Palm Sunday. Uh, it's actually the weekend. Um, oh, here we go. Here's my cheat sheet notes. Very good. Um, and um, so there are 14 people we need uh, to play those roles. 
Um, and it's being directed by someone from Wycliffe who's coming down from Queensland to actually uh, lead us through that in the few weeks leading up to it. And we're planning to do it in the town square. So we really just see there's an opportunity for the churches to get together and to declare what's Easter about in a dramatic way uh, in the town square for two days on the Saturday and the Sunday uh, of that Palm Sunday weekend. And uh, you may not think that you can act. Um, I'm in that club. But uh, there are many different roles, people that you may be able to help in different support ways. And um, it's a really exciting venture. We, it, we've been really, really blown away by the number of churches. I think we had seven churches at the last meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago. And there is a group of people that are going across to watch the John drama being done in Bendigo. The, one of the churches over in Bendigo is doing it on the 21st and 22nd of October. So there's a delegation going across from here to have a look, have a spy how they do it. And, um, and, but if you wanted to uh, be a part of that, then please do let Karina know. She's the, the maestro behind all of that. And there is a meeting uh, going to be happening in a few weeks again at our house um, to talk about it. And it's written there. She's pointing at me. Next meeting is Tuesday 7th of November at 7 p.m. at our place. But feel free to see us afterwards if you have any interest in that. We'd love to have it. It's, it's just wonderful to see the churches coming together to declare Christ in that way. Thank you.